you're balancing being a mother, being a wife, and being a representative. Sean Lurie, that was not just an iconic culture, he was my father, because she was left widowed with seven kids. So maybe the seeds were sown from a very young age of what's right and wrong. The history that I have has shaped me to be the person that I am. Seven years ago was a different Ireland. Um, I see a president that needs to be compassionate, that needs to be caring. Fighter for those who are completely left off, representing all that is good in us as people. Well, it's Misha. I am Leonie Rieda. I'm a member of the European Parliament for Ireland South. Um, I'm from Kule, which is in the heart of the Muscri Muscri Gueltacht. I've lived here all my life, um, and up until 2014, I was really a full-time stay-at-home mom. Um, I'm mother to three children, Caught, Elsa and Nance. Uh, two of them are still in secondary school and one is in national school. So it's a very busy, busy household. Um, I'm married to the most amazing man called Nicky Ford. I think he must be the best husband in Ireland. I'm sure other women out there would probably disagree, but he has been uh, an amazing force in my life of stability and looking after kids. And allowing me, I suppose, to be in the position that I'm in now, that I can go over to Brussels on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, to do the work that an MEP does. Um, it's a tough station in that regard because you're balancing being a mother, being a wife and being a representative for all of Ireland South. Yeah, it's a huge constituency, it's 10 counties, so if you draw a line from County Clare all the way over to Wicklow and down to Kerry, it's all those counties. Um, and for me, I suppose it's been fantastic in getting to know the different issues because all the counties, although there are similar issues, they're quite unique. We're quite tribal as people, I suppose. And even if you go three miles up the road to Coulé, there's a slightly different kind of culture there to where we are here in Balavorna, even though we're all part of a Gaeltacht. So it's interesting for me to discover all those kind of histories that we have in all the counties of Ireland South. Uh, and you're learning every single day. But I suppose my heart is really in the most Greek Gaeltacht. It really is. With a name like Orieda, uh, it's always linked to culture. Um, but people have to remember as well that Sean Orieda was not just an iconic culture, he was my father. I didn't know him because I was very young when he died. I was maybe three and a half, four. Uh, but his legacy was, was still there even after he died because we had so many people come into the house and you were just known as, a, as one of the Oriadas and you were automatically linked to culture because of the name. And, and that, of course, would make you think about what it was all about. Uh, so it was an innate sense of that connection to what it is to be Irish. Uh, we all grew up with that and it has left a mark and shaped me to be the person that I am. And culture here, the Moscow Gaeltacht, is very rich in terms of literature and poetry and song and dance. I'm the youngest of seven, um, so I suppose from an early age I always had to try and find my own voice because it's difficult in a noisy house of seven siblings and when you're the youngest one and everybody else can kind of boss you around you have to learn quite young to be able to stand your ground but we were an exceptionally close family um, at, times were very different back then you know there was no social media or even television so we were outside uh, like most people in my generation would have been playing outside uh, and had that kind of imagination I suppose to do that we spent an awful lot of time and the river is just right right next to the house where I grew up. Uh, so we spent a huge amount of time going native in the river, uh, swimming, you know, fishing for collies, playing water games, all of that. We wouldn't come in until late at night, really. Uh, and it's a farm farm area. It's the, the hinterland is very rugged. It's very it's not arable land. It's not very good. Uh, but nonetheless, it was the usual things of playing with sticks and pretending to be horses and helping out in neighbouring farmyards and all of that. Um, it was a very healthy lifestyle because we were outside all the time. But for country people, um, that connection to the land is just something that you will never escape from. And I don't think we would want to escape from it. It's part of our DNA. It's part of what makes us Irish, I think, that deep-rooted historical connection we have to the land. And it feeds into the whole area here as well. It, it's always been a very strong Republican area. It has a very rich history of that. Uh, you had that wonderful book where mountainy men have sown because we are surrounded by mountains um, and that history is there in the back of our brains as well. Um, it's not something you think of every day, but it's shaped, I suppose, this community. And then there was a lot of books, you know, that old fashioned thing called books. We used to read a lot of books, which was great. I try and instill that in my own kids now because I think books are a wonderful way to escape. 
uh, and to learn obviously and all kinds of things it enriches us so much so then there was music we all played well not all of us I play music um, and I think that was a very how would you say a very music for me personally was was a great saving grace for me it was an escape route my mother was a very accomplished woman in her own right um, she was writing as a journalist wrote pieces for uh, a newspaper in Kerry um, and I remember she used to go back there on a weekly basis there was always a huge panic to get the article written and then hop into the car and drive back uh, with the copy and she was a very socially active and socially conscious strong woman um, and that would have left a mark on me even though she died as well when I was 10 so that was really really tough uh, when she died but up until then I think she had because she was such a strong individual and such a strong character and a woman ahead of her time I would say uh, that definitely left a mark on all of us uh, and for me it was that sense of standing up for what was right I remember when I was younger I used to always say everything wasn't fair and life wasn't fair and I must have had from a very young age again possibly because being the youngest of seven that you know there was everything was an injustice and everything was unfair and my mother would always say oh it's an injustice and it's something that stuck with me that I could see that life wasn't fair but that doesn't mean that you accept it and that you use it as an excuse to not do anything about it so maybe the seeds were sown from a very young age of what's right and wrong and what you need to do to correct that um, but yeah it was a busy noisy train station type of a household where we did have a lot of freedom I suppose when both my parents died we were all teenagers well except for me being the youngest one um, and obviously going through teenage years is tough for anybody so and having no kind of guidance in that regard was even tougher again because you're navigating your place in the world so I think it did uh, shaped me in the sense that I became incredibly independent um, independently minded as well and there was no blueprint or guidance but we just had this innate sense again of what's right what's wrong and how you treat other people and because you come from that kind of vulnerable part in life that you're not privileged that you don't that you have to fight for everything you had to fight for survival almost to keep roof and body and soul together it makes you far more compassionate and empathic to other people who are going through that. Well, it was interesting actually because I wanted to study music and I had this thing in my head that I was going to do music therapy and the only place that I could do music was in Limerick. So I went to live with my aunt, my father's only sister. So that was a different experience. It pulled me right from the countryside into Limerick when I was 15 because there was nobody at home that could mind me really. There was no thing of coming in and the dinner would be on the table you know you'd come into the house to be cold and you'd be lighting fires and trying to see was there stuff to eat and it just wasn't great for me that there was nobody there because everybody else was off doing their own thing the rest of the family were off to college and getting married and all sorts of other things so anyway between the hill and hunt I moved to Limerick and lived with my aunt uh, and uncle and went to school in Laurel Hill uh, and did my leaving cert there and after that I took a couple of it was like the early 80s and it was tough in Ireland at the time. Uh, so many people were emigrating um, and I did different kind of things, bits and pieces of courses in different colleges. Um, and it was very tough to get work, but luckily enough, I trained with RTE and Udrasveth and became a television director, producer. I was living in Dublin and I was very lucky to have to, to meet a neighbour of mine actually from Coulee. His name was Fiechra and we met at a wedding. So he was oh, he was an amazing man. He was in his early 20s. I was a few years older than him, uh, but in my 20s. And he was incredible. He was a really gentle character. Again, really would always stand up for the underdog. Terribly shy individual, but if he saw something that was wrong, it, it would suddenly just get under his skin. So I was very lucky to have that experience with him. We fell madly in love, got married, um, but unfortunately he had cancer and he died two months before our first wedding anniversary. Completely unexpected, I suppose. We thought, love's young dream, we can beat this, you know, and it was that kind of incredible optimism that we thought that wasn't going to happen, but it did. Um, but luckily I was blessed the second time because I met an even more incredible man with my now husband, Nicky, who kind of brought me out of the depths of a really dark place.
in 2011, I had just finished a European diploma on cultural project management. Then I saw an advert, believe it or not, saying that Sinn Féin were looking for a national Gaelic officer. And Gaelic being my first grow, really. I had to learn English when I went to school. I didn't have any English. So I applied for the position and I had looked at Sinn Féin as a party and I thought, do you know what? They fed in very much to my ethos of what of that right and wrong thing. What is it to fix an injustice when you see something that's wrong? It's not good enough to just comment about it. You have to become active. So that really, I think, inspired me along those lines. And also it fed into my whole idea of who we are as Irish people and taking ownership of that. So thankfully, I got the job with Sinn Féin became more and more involved and then I was asked to see would I be interested in standing for the European elections, which I did. Willingly at the time, not realising what a baptism of fire it was going to be and how it was going to change all of our lives in this household to upside down and change it did, but for the better. It was such a unique experience to open your eyes to how we are seen, I suppose, as Irish people in Europe. Um, and it made me far more outward looking than insular. And I think we have to, as a country, be far more outward looking and we have to take our place and rightly so uh, among Europe and indeed among the world, I think, and be leaders in what we can do as a country. So Europe has given me that experience, which has been invaluable. Um, for me, it was about standing up for the Irish people. I have a huge constituency um, every Monday morning, sometimes at four o'clock in the morning, poor Nikki has to get out of bed and drive me to the airport. Uh, and drop me off and say good luck and I'm always kind of saying try not to wake the kids uh, and off I go to Brussels or Strasbourg as the case may be and then I'm back home on a Thursday night and Nikki collects his poor wife exhausted coming back in Cork airport again and it's then constituency business for the few days and then you're back in the hamster wheel again and back out to Brussels. Um, it's tough on the kids I'm sure because but it's funny you know I could be out in Brussels in a committee meeting and we could be talking about fisheries or budget stuff or big ticket issues and in the middle of it something would pop into my head like you know Ailsa has her heart listen today did Nance get to the dentist so you're constantly balancing those two things your mind is always your heart is always at home but your mind has to be absolutely focused on the job and I'm sure most women feel like that that there's a certain amount of guilt that you're not there to kind of hold their hand going to the dentist or the doctor's appointment or helping with the homework but technology being the way it is I managed to kind of do some of that through uh, Skype and stuff when I'm over in Brussels but Brussels an incredible experience and for me it's about firmly putting Irish the Irish interest uh, front and centre every single committee it's not something that you take on lightly it's a huge responsibility because you are going to be the first citizen of this country uh, and that carries a huge weight with it but I believe that coming from where I come from, the history that I have has shaped me to be the person that I am. And I see a president that needs to be compassionate, that needs to be caring, that has to lead the way in terms of a new Ireland. We are a modern society that is progressing all the time. We are leaders in that. We've seen with the marriage equality um, and we need to take ownership of that and have that conversation about imagining what kind of a new Ireland are we going to see. We obviously see with Brexit is having an enormous impact. When I'm over in Brussels, um, I was actually having a conversation with an MEP yesterday from a different political party who was saying now is the time for a united Ireland. And I was saying, yes, this is becoming a reality where we have a, a mature discussion about it now, that it's not just something that is an aspiration because this is something that the Irish people, I think, inherently, innately, again, it's to do with that land connection, it's to do with that identity, that we talk about a united Ireland. What do we want as a united Ireland? Uh, it's in the Constitution that there's room there for a united Ireland. And it's time that we at least start that conversation. And I don't think that's something that we were ready for seven years ago, but I think it's something we're ready for now to have that discussion. Seven years ago was a different Ireland. Uh, and we are constantly, it's a fluid society, it's a modern society. And for that, I think we need somebody who has both the past connection, but also the future connection. And I see that through my own children, through talking to people on the ground, where we need to be going as a society. And I think the presidency can lead the dialogue on that. 
we will not be able to put in legislation, for instance, or wouldn't have those powers, but that's not to say that should remain silent on them. And it's about that reaching out. It's about looking after our own people. It's about that care. It's about representing all that is good in us as people. I, as an Ochtran, want to serve as somebody who will be a continuous reminder and a constant fighter for those who are completely left out of this country, who are living on the margins, those who are living in hotel rooms, those who are lying in hospital trolleys. But certainly I would be acting as a president that can go in and address the government um, within the parameters of the office to remind them that they have a duty of care. They have a duty of care to look after our citizens. They have a duty of care to look after our most vulnerable, where nobody in this country, north, south, east or west, is left behind. 